And what we found was the pivot to direct numerically. So not, not kind of intuitively and not qualitatively, simply quantitatively, the actual facts boots on the ground said as companies pivot to direct, we did not see an increase in revenues. We did not see an increase in gross margin rate. We did not see an increase in profitability rate and EBIT rate. And we did not see an increase in profit dollars. And every one of those four things was shocking in and of itself. And it turned into this massive string. Most of our reports don't take six months to do, but this one was like a constant learning experience and will still be so. And I think we'll have this fascinating conversation around it and different hypotheses. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we have the data benefit. We have the customer benefit. Like we all know why we want to go direct. And yet, if it, the numbers don't answer that, that needs to be explained and that needs to be looked into. I think like most of these things, I almost think of like the pivot to DTC in many ways, like uh, early or sort of 19th century naturalists who used to come into forests, look at them and say they're entirely too complex. We should just impose some order on this and it'll operate more effectively. And I think what it misses is that in this complex ecology that is retail, is that there's all kinds of relationships that are latent or not necessarily, you know, obvious that are there. The parallel I, I often come back to with the trend towards DTC and remember Gary I wrote a piece for Retail Insider early January, 2020, saying the biggest trend of the last decade was DTC and it was still going strong. If I was in an organization that situation, I would be saying like, let's escape. But I may not be asking the question, what I should be asking is, what do I need to escape in terms of skill sets? Mm. So if I haven't got a particularly strong story, a strong brand, maybe my CFO is telling me, you know, this, this makes sense. Welcome, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Gary Newbury. I'm a senior executive on call, helping businesses in the make, move, sell flow of consumer goods and services. My purpose is to inspire business leaders, particularly those within the consumer products and retailing space, to think big, be bold, scale, adapt and win one epic supply chain transformation at a time. There's additional content available through my website, retailaid.ca, or on my YouTube channel, Retail Aid. Be sure to check it out. As a business world faces much volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, organisations need to be tapping into resources with an inside edge on transitioning their teams to be agile, innovative and digital with thought leaders, experts and senior executives who have mastery of operational turnarounds and strategic transformations to help reorientate their enterprises. There's great material to get through here, so let's get started. Thanks for joining us today. I've got some great people to talk about the whole concept of direct-to-consumer. I've got Carl Bate, Jeff Roberts, and Simeon Sigal, and myself, Gary Newbury. And just as background, I'm a senior exec on call, specializing in rapid performance improvement across retail supply chains and the last mile. So perhaps Carl, or we should, should we say baseball cap for Carl? I'm doing, doing my inner Chris Walton. Uh, that's all I'm doing here, Gary. It's all I try to do really in life is, is, is channel Chris whenever I can. Do you want to give us a quick intro for those people who haven't uh, seen the previous copy? Yeah, I think I've pretty much said it all. I mean, I'm probably <laughs> saying I'm channeling Chris Walton. Oh, right. Okay. That's it, Jeff. <laughs> I mean, that's hard to follow. I mean, those are having to do be Anna then in that case, then if you're Chris. Um, so uh, I'm Jeff Roberts. I'm a, a management consultant based out of London, uh, primarily do uh, strategy and business model work, principally been aligned for the past 15 or so years to retail and consumer products companies. And I've done this work both uh, in-house and, and as management consultant where I've been for the longest period of my career. Simeon? Great, thanks. I'm trying to think of who I'm channeling. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna work on that. It makes the intro that much easier. Uh, <laughs> So I'm a managing director at BMO Capital Markets. I'm an equity analyst focusing on retail, which essentially means I get to chronicle and watch this uh, amazingly revolutionary, evolutionary, whatever other rhymes with that changing landscape across the beautiful world of consumer discretionary, why people spend on what they spend on. So looking forward to this conversation. Simeon and his team generated a report which uh, laid bare the claim that going D2C is a brilliant thing that all, all brands should consider. 
And that report actually gave the indications that the financials don't really add up to, to that picture. So in, in the old world, go in D2C, you get all the customer insights, you have great ideas for product innovation, you really listen to your customer, whereas going through a secondary channel, it kind of gets watered down. You, you don't always get all the ins and outs, and also you have to pay somebody to do the distribution and, and retailing for you. I've got a couple of really strong retail guys with us, as well as, obviously, as well as Simeon, to try and explore what might be missing. Why might direct-to-consumer switch from, say, a, a hybrid model, say wholesaling and D2C, or just a straight from wholesaling straight to D2C? What, what might go wrong in that situation that the textbook, which says you should be in a much better position, what might be going wrong there? I don't know if anybody wants to kick off with a view on that, or maybe Simeon wants to just chip in and just give us some background on, on the, the study that he did, uh, he and his team did. Well, you just, by the way, gave me my Carl moment here. I could just channel my inner Gary. That was like such a perfect synopsis of this report. So I can just, you know. <laughs> um, so I think what we found, the, 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 sh the shortest version of this, the takeaway, and then to be clear, this was a six month drastic challenge to the way we were thinking as well. So this wasn't as if I started out to disprove DTC. This was, the hypothesis was simply, let's just show it because everyone is talking about it. Every large brand is making this push to say, we are going to see the next leg of growth and margin via direct. And every small brand is saying, we are going to start by not ever introducing the idea of wholesale. So within that framework, that was, that was simply the, the mission. And what we found was the pivot to direct numerically. So not, not kind of intuitively and not qualitatively, simply quantitatively, the actual facts, boots on the ground said, as companies pivot to direct, we did not see an increase in revenues. We did not see an increase in gross margin rate. We did not see an increase in profitability rate and EBIT rate. And we did not see an increase in profit dollars. And every one of those four things was shocking in and of itself. And it turned into this massive string. Most of our reports don't take six months to do, but this one was like a constant learning experience and will still be so. And I think we'll have this fascinating conversation around it and different hypotheses. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we have the data benefit. We have the customer benefit. Like we all know why we want to go direct. And yet, if it, the numbers don't answer that, that needs to be explained and that needs to be looked into. On the face of it, DTC is one of those things where you think, right, it's, it's a no brainer. You own more of the customer or consumer relationship. You have more direct access to the data. Arguably, you control how your brand is positioned and how ultimately it shows up in a consumer's purchasing process. But I think like most of these things, I almost think of like the pivot to DTC in many ways, like uh, early or sort of 19th century naturalists who used to come into forests look at them and say they're entirely too complex. We should just impose some order on this and it'll work, it'll operate more effectively. And I think what it misses is that in this complex ecology that is retail, is that there's all kinds of relationships that are latent or not necessarily you know, obvious that are there. So just like in a forest, right? You just by cleaning it up, planting the trees in straight lines, doesn't make them grow better because we, we didn't see the fact that the clumpy mass that they're in is actually better for say, light protection or water sharing, whatever the case may be. And it's the same idea of, to say that retail, you can lift out and just focus exclusively on a channel model. I think it elides the wider, the wider environment in which it operates. And, and to my mind, I think that's the thing that many companies that have made a hard pivot into this discover that rather rapidly, that there's an awful lot of heavy lifting. There's an awful lot of environmental support that comes from things that were previously considered hindrances to owning the experience or owning the end-to-end -end brand management. The parallel I, I often come back to with this move, you know, the, the, the trend towards DTC and remember Gary, I wrote a piece for Retail Insider early January, 2020, saying the biggest trend of the last decade was DTC and it was still going strong. I was hoping that the biggest trend of this decade would be around sustainability. The debate is still very much alive. And, and the parallel I often come back to is the decision the brands make around distribution via franchise model or dealership network, you know, and, and the pros and cons of that I find are very parallel to D2C argument a lot around brand control, decision-making speed, uh, and, and ability to scale, uh, quite honestly. So uh, obviously we now have examples like Tesla that show us that the dealer network model might not be as necessary. So they want to control the end to end, but contrary to most other brand stories, they also have a technology story that's unparalleled. 
Another one we could consider in a similar vein is Lululemon, you know, that's had a ton of success, same thing, right? And, and, and but both had really strong value propositions, really um, unique, I'd say, leadership uh, through Chip Wilson and Elon Musk, obviously, you know, Chip hasn't been there for a while, but even still, I mean, they're going, uh, Calvin's doing amazing. I mean, they're maintaining that sort of thing and they'd be crazy to give that up. Right. Um, but now I come back to, I think the poster child for, for this argument, and it's not Warby or, or Casper, it's Nike. I don't know if you guys remember in 2017, when they came out and said, we're going to go from 55,000 retail partners to 40. Because we want to really rein in, and they, you know, they they're far from that number still. But look at the investments they've made. Look at um, the moves they're making around owning and creating these even these small footprint stores that are one just opened, I think, in Wisconsin last week. At the same time, look, they announced last week we're going to we're partnering with Dicks and we're going to share our loyalty programs. So who the hell even knows what direct to consumer really means anymore? <laughs> when this, is that you know that, that's the, the question I keep coming back with, and I, I'm I'm taking this data and analytics class right now, and we had the head of uh, Starbucks on yesterday, head of data analytics from Starbucks speaking to the class, and I bring up that example. I, I'm starting to actually even try to figure out what the heck first data party, uh, first party data is even still, and I think that's usually the main argument for that's the main argument for for direct to consumer. So. Is, is, is Nike doing a loyalty program with Dix fully integrated? Does that make them a, a common first party? And is that direct to consumer? Uh, and then I'll finish with this. I mean, I still get, still get into arguments when people saying, taking, using, showing a brand as an example that sells on Amazon. And I'm still questioning my head if that's direct to consumer as well. So, uh, but I really love, I mean, I really love the analysis. I'm glad somebody started, you really, you know, tried to pull, pull apart the numbers and it's very interesting finding especially in lieu of all the IPOs we've seen in, in the last couple of months of these brands and, and Allbirds just last week to see where the numbers are going to fall versus the more traditional approaches. So I thought the market was a little more frothy around this and you've, you've proved us wrong. So that's, uh, that's some really important insight. There's a few really interesting things in there that just I'll just to touch on. So like Carl, like one thing with Lulu that you brought up, you mentioned Chip and you mentioned Calvin. And you kind of skipped five other CEOs in between. Like there's this interesting dynamic here where I think, listen, retail is all about storytelling. And Jeff's parallel is so perfect because it's literally the forest and the tree, right? Like that is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about companies that are so intrinsically linked to marketing. They're so intrinsically linked to storytelling. Well, they tell the same story. They're great at telling stories to their consumers, but they're also great at telling stories to us and to the world. And so we're, we're left thinking that Lululemon the ultimate vertical integration story is the most seamless management story. And yet you look back and what you see is there's just such a strong brand that we ignore the fact that there's been a rotating managerial position there. And to Nike's positioning, Nike is the largest wholesaler in the world. And yet, right, they, they didn't walk away. Their push to DTC was not to walk away from wholesale, to walk away from undifferentiated wholesale. And so that leads into to kind of your point. And, and I think, and this is something that I didn't talk about in the report, but I've thought about ever since, I think a very interesting parallel is the question is simply, do you eliminate a middleman? That, that is ultimately the notion, right? Digitally native is the idea of if I eliminate the middleman, then I can afford to give up something else because there's room and I can make more money. No one eliminates middlemen, right? Lulu still doesn't own its factories, but more importantly than that, I was thinking about this. We have distribution and we have marketing. So digital, name me a digitally native company that does not outsource their marketing to another agency. So if the whole conversation is why am I scared about giving my brand over to a wholesaler that's going to distribute my product, why do I not ask that question about giving my story to a brand, to a company that's going to distribute my message? Because ultimately, what is really different there, and I think that inherently is this, there will always be a middleman. Hmm. The story became eliminate the, the, the department store. But at the end of the day, I think we find the middleman serves a purpose across all aspects of this ecosystem. I think it's attention spans, right? I think that's a great point, is that the organization itself has only so much attention it can throw at any particular set of problems. And fundamentally, the whole reason that you do outsource things to agencies, you still have a marketing team, but there's obviously the agency relationship to support with product development or with creative or whatever the case may be. 
And it's it's recognizing, I think, and this is where Nike, I think, is a great example of this. You know, if you if you look at how they have made that restructure and how they've done that internally, they have mobilized a significant amount of their internal workforce to move this, right? It's not like they woke up one day and said, right, we're gonna do that. I mean, there are literally thousands of people in that organization that are toiling away to pivot this thing into a new direction to move them. And I think that's because they recognize. And it's a rebalancing of attention spans across what can you realistically achieve inside the organization and what should you really own and where should you place bets and what should you own and how should you manage that and how do you create it, et cetera, et cetera. And then what does it make sense to look for help? You know, because you want fresh information, you need to bring that in from the outside world. And that's a pivotal role that your wholesaler can bring. It can be, you know, the pivotal role that your marketing agency brings. And, and I think it's, it's finding that dynamic and recognizing that you simply can't do everything. And that, and that when you are going to do what you're going to do, you know, figure out, and that's obviously, it's a big question that a lot of companies spend a lot of time throwing a lot of money at, but determine what you want to do and how you're going to do it well. And then what are the kind of relationships that, that augment that, that are ultimately um, accretive to the, to the business operations, because they add back something or they, they bring in again, either with the fresh information or novel insight or whatever the case may be that allows you to operate more effectively. No, I think it's right. You can't, you'll never eradicate unless you're, you're a single organization that dominates the entire market. And, and we saw what that happened in the U.S. in the, in the 1900s. So I think that, you know, it's, a, it's an argument there. I think as a cook's returning, there's, there's strong brands and strong stories that may facilitate a good move to D to C models. And there are other models which are in the wholesale environment may, may have a D to C kind of variant. But those models require adjacencies. The brand is not that strong. It needs to be around, say, if you're in apparel, you go into a department store or you're, you offer a concession to go into another store where other similar brands might appear as well. So you, you benefit from the traffic, the, the fruit paths to, around, your, uh, around your, your store is just not strong enough. So I, I'm wondering if that is a critical factor that organizations ought to be thinking about. How strong is our story before we even consider uh, a, a, a movement from where we are? How strong, Gary, and I think Simeon really said the key word in the whole debate is differentiation. You know, how diff how truly different are you? And it's funny because I'm thinking back to a, a, a panel I, I caught, I think it was Shop Talk maybe two, three, four years ago, and it was uh, and it was the founder of Red Antler, which is the, the marketing firm that pretty much created probably three quarters of these DNVB brands. And he said, if you look at it, it comes down to basically they'd walk in and say, do you feel, are you more Brooklyn or Austin? And that was sort of the way that they basically broke down the branding for 80% of TNVB, you're Brooklyn or you're Austin. And now I don't even know if we can tell the two apart, quite honestly, but that was pretty much the, so how differentiated is that at the end of the day, when we have 22 different uh, direct to consumer uh, mattress companies and, and, and 50 different eyeglass companies, and they're all either Brooklyn or, or Austin. So, and, and that is really, truly in bringing it back, especially Lulu, I think the idea of differentiation, I mean, there's been a lot of people have tried to copy. Even here in Montreal, we have a company called Lole that's been, you know, did pretty much around the same time uh, as Lulu started, but never really got that, that, that essence. And, and that was to your point, I mean, yeah, I mean, Laurent, there's a bunch of other CEOs that came through, but the, the groundwork was there before and, and it took now Calvin to come in and, and, and sort of I leverage that and now with the mirror acquisition which is you know super fascinating see where they where how, how that evolves even further and they, they build that bond even more using technology to get that much closer but differentiation is the key i mean that's and it always has been in some ways i mean it's always been where and so is the difference the product is the difference the channel is the difference the marketing message is there a difference the geography i mean these are all these are all going to be the elements the, the, the strategically, the decisions are made around, do I go truly, truly direct? Or as everyone else sort of pointing out, nothing's really perfectly direct anyways. Um, and, and, and at what point is value added? And, and that's, that's the key point. And it's, and it's shifting at this point, maybe the value is not added by distribution. Maybe the value added is by the story or the narrative, but where is that difference differentiation? And we can get away from this D to C versus non D to C debate and just, and just focus on where the differentiation occurs. And, and that's really what the analysts and the dollars are going to show us at the end anyways. 
Isn't it funny? It's like the first Sorry. class you learn Econ 101 is just price elasticity of demand. It's how many units do you sell and what do you sell them for? And then we spend decades trying to forget the simplicity of that and think about channels and regions and products and story. And like, it's how much do you sell? How much do you sell it for? And focus on your core customer. And I think, Gary, you and I have talked about this. I think there's an element here where it's leadership. There's no company that's run by data. Every company is run by a human. And humans are not hotwired to acknowledge when we've hit a certain peak and when heuristics work. Like, that's just not what, how we think. And so another, we didn't talk about this, another piece of work that my team did was we looked, we actually found there's certain levels where brands peak. And so we took North America sales, we grossed them up for any wholesale and licensing. And we found that there's the, there are these ubiquity levels. So if you're a DTC only brand, and I mean DTC with stores and e -com, so if you don't use wholesale, you peak at $3 billion. If you have wholesale, you get five to six. But what happens without exception is that everyone stretches a little far, right? Under Armour bought Connected Fitness. Other companies that sell more basics bring in a high profile designer and bedazzle their denim. But what happens is you realize that you're trying to stretch beyond where your core customer has gotten you to. And there's nothing wrong with you, you're just very big. And so I wonder if a little bit of the channel mix conversation is actually more of a signal that a brand hits a certain level of maturity and they've tapped out wholesale. Because by definition, the beauty is all these giant companies that are pulling back from wholesale are the ones that built colossal and healthy businesses at wholesale in the first place. I think it's a great point, right? It's it's much easier. I mean, I'm just stealing um, Byron Sharp here, right? You know, it's, it's much easier to sell when you're famous. And so by virtue of getting your, your, your um, product out into as many hands as humanly possible, it makes it much easier to then subsequently prune the bush and bring it back to where to where you think you want to play, where you can own more of that. I mean, but I think what's interesting, because it was an earlier point that you raised, Gary, and I think it sort of plays off the back of this around, are you buying stuff? You know, what role does it play to have it, say, showing up with other brands and et cetera? And I think that's one of the one of the key things that, that was perhaps not spoken to in the sort of uh, DTC world is that by actually categorizing yourself and showing up and being merchandised with other similar products, it actually can drive that differentiation point that Carl pointed to, right? Is that it, you can actually make it real in the context. It was the whole idea of the department store, right? Is that you could make it easy to come in and look at multiple things, then subsequently see the array in front of you and then make a choice based on what the what it looks like in that lineup. You know, and I think what you can see is that, you know, Target, I think in the US has done a great job of this, is sort of evolving that model into a new direction with taking just the, you know, bringing concessions in, you know, looking what they're doing there, but also being able to show again within that, putting them against other products that would be in a similar category or a similar range so that you can make a more informed decision about it. So I think it's an interesting one because it is in many ways a chicken and the egg, right? DTC's low, low entry cost, right? That's an easy place to start as a startup. But ultimately, if you want to get big and then ultimately make your life more successful, you're going to need to find other channels through. And then you need to be positioned against other products to drive that differentiation. So that then when you reach a size that you can then sort of start making decisions around what you are, because until you reach a certain point, you know, you're at the whim of your shopper. <laughs> I think that's part of the, part of the problem you have to sort of overcome with this, which is why I think there's probably, I mean, I love novelty and I, I'm, I'm terribly bad for it. You know, I chase the next shiny thing probably more aggressively than most. And so I remain super excited about DTC. I think it is a cool way because it, it allows more small brands to show up that would perhaps not be able to show up under, under previous regimes. And so you're getting some interesting stuff that's there. But I think with, with most things, we misread the signal and we take it as that, well, this is revolution. This is changing everything. When in actuality, it's just a profusion of new things coming through because existing channels had gotten clogged and this gave you a new route in. I, I was thinking the same thing, Jeff. I mean, I think what DDC has mainly done is it's taken a very static industry and given it sort of the jolt that Uber's mm -hmm. done to, to cab riding, to Airbnb's done to hospitality, yeah. like where, where we just got a little too comfortable with the way things were. Mm -hmm. And if I, you know, in eyewear, I was, you know, I was, you know, obviously happy making whatever 700% margin that, that, that Luxottica <laughs> would be making. And, and, and then somebody came along and said, Hey, that's not necessary. And, and then it sort of forces everybody to look at each other, you know, look at themselves in the mirror and yeah. say, okay, what's really the value that I'm generating? And if I just got a little too comfortable with, with <laughs> the way things are going, and this is this, as much as Warby's probably never going to make a profit. I, I, I was close to the betting industry for a couple of years and talk about mm -hmm. an, an archaic industry. And, and, you know, Casper came along and made fun of the industry. Basically they actually pulled their first commercial because it was just so aggressive against the typical mattress buying experience, you know, and, and anyways, and, and 
I really woke up like it was basically two or three big companies that basically it's all of a sudden said, okay, we've got to rethink this and or and eventually buy them out, obviously. But that's that's another story, which is probably what the best D2C trick is. That's, I mean, maybe track those that are just lining up for, for acquisition. They just disrupt enough so that they, they piss off the big enough player that they're going to become an acquisition target to and right off into the sunset, like uh, our friends at... Uh, at Harry's or whatever did, you know, or Dollar, <laughs> Dollar Shave Club or all these guys. How many of the brands you just mentioned now sell wholesale? I know. And it's, and it's funny because it's actually sort of an ebb and flow, right? So you start, you, you, Jeff, there's no way you can start, direct, you know, being wholesale unless you have a really, like you had a business before and you have a network and you know, and you have this confidence and this reputation where you say, hey guys, you knew me in the electronics business, but now I'm getting into the apparel business and, and can you sell my stuff? I mean, I did a lot of work with Costco for years I and mean, Costco worked yeah, a lot yeah. with that. It was very much relationship built. And, and, you know, so if you knew the buyers and say, listen, I got this next, I've just got my you know, a friend in Korea that's making this thing it's amazing can you sell it for me maybe that will work but that's very rare most of the time you got to start direct there's no other way you start direct small you scale and then some people break hey, can i start sell that thing for you and then you ebb and flow into the different distribution models but carl that's wholesale too right lulu was in all these grassroots yoga studios viore and roan and four laps and that, like they all found their way on a peloton capsule so wholesale doesn't have to mean department store so like this idea and that's why like we're talking about it from the largest size, but what I think is also so important is for people that are starting brands now, don't be disillusioned. Don't be scared away by this word. Wholesales become evil. And yet there's a, some very successful small brands that we think about as being digitally native, but they're not. We think about as being DTC only, but they're not. And they're making great use of great partners. And Carl, it goes back to your point, like differentiation. Use good wholesale. Don't just, right? Like we talk about it as if it's one entity. And let me ask you a question. I mean, we've got luxury wholesalers and we've got off pricers and they're different roles for different people. Would we ever compare LVMH to TJX simply because they both sell apparel? <laughs> like we group this thing together in a way that we don't group other things. It's very interesting. And we're focusing on fashion too, by the way. So if you're in, yeah. if, we, if, we were, if we were thinking about grocery, I met a, one of the largest sausage manufacturers, like, yeah, we're trying to figure out how to go direct. How does a sausage manufacturer go direct? Maybe I'm sure they can, the platforms and technology is there to do it. Mm -hmm. No problem. But who really wants to have the direct relationship with the sausage manufacturer? But yeah, I know that was a point that was at a time as a couple of years ago where they were that this was a number one item in everybody's agenda. We want to own the relationship with the customer until they figured out how hard that was and wasn't really necessarily to your point your research i mean it wasn't necessarily translating the mar better margin as they thought it would so that's the big the big x factor in all this yeah i just wonder you know just going back to broadly the fashion category which which the, the normal wholesale relationship would be department stores and over say the last 20 years they've been in a pretty strong decline uh, and they're still surviving somehow many of them but uh, i don't think for much longer but maybe some of the D to C interest was to actually get out of that format. I think that if I was in an organization that situation, I would be saying like, let's escape, but I may not be asking the question what I should be asking is what do I need to escape in terms of skill sets? So if I haven't got a particularly strong story, a strong brand, but I feel, you know, maybe my CFO is telling me, you know, this, this makes sense. So I, I do that switch, but I don't actually invest in some of the things that I need, like really strong marketing skills, really strong leadership, the ability to fulfill electronically e-commerce in a different way. Uh, maybe I need to think about my whole portfolio of products and I need to reduce it to allow that to be done in some ways profitably e-commerce wise. I, I wonder if if there's been a, a movement, I don't know if we'll be able to comment on that, but a movement out of uh, formats, maybe off of Amazon, that's not a dying platform, but maybe being in with too many adjacencies and a, a fairly poor search platform, I, I, I need to get away from that because my brand is not popping up quickly enough in the searches my customers uh, perform. So I just wonder if, if anybody's got any thoughts about that. It's an interesting one. I think this will probably be near and dear to Simeon's heart, I know, is it the thing about Peloton. Right. And so what they had was, you know, you had it, you had the ultimate there, you know, the ultimate luxury non-fashion uh, DTC brand that had the world's best luck, if you were, well, if you can look at it that way, but obviously had not developed out the operational backbone uh, that would allow you to scale effectively on that front. 
And so, and it, it's an interesting one in my mind. I mean, again, I'm at the outer limits on this one, so I will definitely defer assuming because I know you and your team have done a fair amount of work on this, but, but it's an interesting one to my mind because, you know, you had, you had this great brand, which obviously had a, a, a cultish level of following behind it. And I mean that the best possible way, but, you know, everyone I know owns a Peloton is absolutely committed to it. And so you, you had this great environment and then you had basically the perfect storm for a product like that to show, to show up with the pandemic and then you had this opportunity. But what you could see is that I think it's a case where, again, it was, it was perhaps too much narrative to the detriment of operational infrastructure. So there was a terrific amount of narrative to it. And it, was, it wasn't even a supply chain whiplash, right? I mean, it was more of a just, there's no, there's no material there or no content. But I mean, to my mind, I think that's a nice, very recent example, but I, I'll look at Simeon on that because I know he, he knows it better than I do. How much time we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so many interesting points that you just opened up. I think that we're, we talked about Nike. We haven't talked about Apple, but it would be relevant. Like, I think Peloton, this drastically smaller business on num a numerical basis, on any, on any annual basis, year basis, lifetime, whatever you want to pick, like a drastically smaller business, probably can hold their own on a marketing basis against like the best marketers in the history of time. Like full stop. I mean, I, we always used to say, like, listen, I, you know my views on Peloton the stock. In every report, I would write on the, the end of the first paragraph, I'd say, recommend the bike, don't recommend the shares. Like, I, I am a huge proponent of Peloton and the story and the product, and, and I've been using it for three years, like all of that stuff. But the issue was, I've actually increasingly now start to worry the pandemic was, was actually a bad thing for them. Like, as crazy as that sounds. We talk about being run by people as opposed to by numbers. The... It's not logical to believe that the growth rate that you would see in a year where you're at, stuck at home with no competition would then flow through as a recurring growth rate. And so the interesting thing, Jeff, was like your point about supply chain was a double whammy because it hurt them. They had no supply or not enough supply when they had that huge demand. But then on the flip side of it, so what happened? They, they kind of, let's get biblical here for a second, right? You had seven years of famine and seven years of feast in reverse. And like the reason that it worked was because he took the seven years of feast and played off for the famine. You had this like period where you, you saw this greatness and then you built the infrastructure. And honestly, we've seen this with other brands in the past where if you believe there's infinite growth and you build for infinite growth and all of a sudden infinite growth becomes really, really successful, but finite growth. You just bought Tonic, the manufacturer, Precore, the equipment provider. You're building Peloton Output Park, which is a domestic manufacturing facility, and you took your inventory from about 200 million to about 1.2 billion. Like you've added a lot. So all of a sudden, on the other side of this, there's this fascinating dynamic where you got too excited. You drank your own marketing message, and what you did there was you're now watching your cash dwindle. At the same time, you're watching your competitors' cash explode. And why are your competitors' cash exploding? Because you brought all the attention to the market, yeah. right? So you brought all this funding. So there's this really interesting dynamic here where as a company, you sit here and you wonder, did you just contract many years? Like if the pandemic hadn't happened, we'd all be talking about this really exciting past startup stage company that's growing at a beautiful rate. But instead, they just brought it all in. And like, I worry now that the investment spend to catch up to that supply chain constraint you were talking about essentially is predicated on the wrong level of demand. I think that's what we saw on the recent earnings where the company said it's now harder to forecast the business. I mean, it's interesting. If you look at this, they give you essentially the backlog. If you divide the backlog by the ending inventory throughout the entirety of the pandemic, it was over 100%. All you have to do is go to your manufacturer and say, if you can make it, I'll take it. As soon as that number dropped below 100%, and now it's around mid-teens, all of a sudden forecasting becomes a lot harder. And I think that's what we're seeing. So it's, there's, again, there's a t it, it's fascinating. And I told, from a marketing perspective, I think there is no one who has done a better job. I think at their peak, the market cap was driven more by the marketing team than it was by the engineers and the instructors. And I don't mean that as a negative to the engineers and instructors. I mean that as a massive set of praise to Peloton's marketing team. But at the end of the day, it's a much smaller company than its voice may have otherwise shown. But it's also stressed the importance for them to diversify, right? With the, this week, they, was it this week they answered and then you with the weights, now they're getting into the supervised weight training and other, and they know the brand is just so strong. It goes well beyond the bike. So if they're going to be able to leverage that, it will be interesting to see maybe this su supply chain crunch will, will provoke. The conversation we just had this most recent, I think what it stresses, and it comes back to 
you know, while we were so bullish in D2C, and now I think we're coming back and showing more appreciation for the legacy players for what they can accomplish. Direct to consumer's biggest strength was its agility and its speed to market. And the fact that it was just so close and so good with data and so close to the customer. And it was, it was really outmoving any of the legacy, but they were where they were strong with that and with marketing, obviously too, uh, without just being uh, Brooklyn or Austin, they were captivating an audience when the legacy players were, were losing that audience. But what they weren't doing at that time was developing the operational chops, the stuff you do, Gary, and, and, and understanding the, the, the hard work and the, and the time it takes and the energy and the resources to build out the operational excellence. At the big guys, let's, let's you know, we'll give it to them. As much as a department, maybe department store is probably not the best example because there's more headwinds in that model that beyond, beyond operational. But it's, it's just the idea that now, so now who do you admire most? <laughs> Coming out of a pandemic with all the issues that go beyond speed to market and agility and, and understanding the customer, who do you admire most? The one that, the one that has this massive operational network uh, and, and that, can, that can really uh, execute or the one that was just really good at customer relationship management and understanding the need and, and, and trying to try and meet it with, with design basically more than, than anything else. So now that's really why I think that's, that's really where we're at right now. We're trying to figure out and the best ones are trying to do both. You know, we'll, we'll use it in a, one more time with Lulu who was, who was able to do all this before. And now they have their, or they're developing the digital. They're still slow on the digital side, but they're getting there. Calvin's definitely pushing hard uh, from his days at uh, Sephora. Uh, and not Sears Canada. Um, and then maybe it's a day at Sears Canada he had versus his days at Sephora. And um, now that's now that we're seeing that play out with Lulu and others that are be, continue to be inspired by that story. But uh, those are few and far between and and operate. Let's not neglect. And I think that's what this pandemic has put is the strength of of just good old operational excellence. People that just know how to how to run a business beyond just creating hype. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I blinked. <laughs> I, I could have jumped in. I just figured I'd been hogging it, Gary. I thought that, that no, was no, like you, you go or... ahead. No, <laughs> I was just going to, you go ahead. I love that. Um, and I think, again, like every part of this business, anything discretionary needs some degree of hype. But at the end of the day, you need that numbers. And uh, I'm going to say something which like is so, uh, it's so simplistic. And yet for some reason, it, it triggers backlash and people don't get it. Ralph Lauren in two weeks, generates in revenues what these high profile companies that supposedly are stealing their market share generates in a year, right? Like revenues matter. And, and at the end of the day, I like to think about the fact we can, listen, we're all here very opinionated. There's no question about that, which means at least I can definitely be very wrong. So sometimes it's nice to be empirical. Revenues are empirical. Revenues are the measure of external brand buy-in, customer buy-in. Gross margin is the measure of brand perception, other NPS, like there's other ways to measure brand perception. But whether a brand has a market, there's no better way than revenues. Last year, we got so excited over Victoria's Secret and Under Armour because everyone kept talking about their dead brands. You're not a dead brand if you're selling $5 billion a cloth. I'm sorry, right? Like, full stop. So there's this fascinating idea here where sometimes I think, listen, it's so important to pour Kool-Aid because that's what sells stories. Just be very careful not to drink it. Right? Maybe drink a little bit, but like tastes good. But at the end of the day, you have to run to your point. You have to run a successful operation. And the thing that I always found a little bit amusing was when people would tell me that these new digitally natives had the absolute best technology people and they blow the others out of the water. I guarantee you that the gap has pretty strong technology people. You just don't talk to them because they're a much bigger organization. And so thinking through these elements of like the people that you see versus the people that exist, not to get Cartesian here, but like, that matters. And so there's a lot of really fun parts to this conversation where like the best part of retail is there's so many platitudes and the best part of platitudes is that they're always wrong. So. <laughs> it's one thing having the people, it's, it's another, another one, listen, another thing listening to them. And in terms of revenue, you know, uh, could you tell that to the people buying the Rivian stock this week, the, the IPO that made it worth more than Ford? <laughs> Pre-order? <laughs> <laughs> Just come back to the, to the point you raised around Belton because I think it's it's it speaks to the larger issue around how the pandemic may have been the worst thing to happen to them, right? Is that when you you want an operation to where you have the opportunity to mature into that. And so if you look at Dollar Shave Club or Harry's or, or those early ones that came in there, I like those principally because 
they were very good at building the back end first, right? They went to Korea, they got the facilities set up, they got their buying relationship set up, they got everything set up in terms of how are you going to move this from there? How does it come in? And then what's the distribution that you come through? And of course, yeah, they put a really interesting ad campaign around it and they did some interesting stuff in the marketing space. And you could see that what they were actually doing was building an end-to-end -end business. And I think what you don't see is a lot of that. And I think there's entirely too much money knocking around the system that's chasing this, right? Is, is to try to find things that somehow will break the fundamentals. You're spot on at the end of the day, if you're not selling something, then what's the point of doing it? And so it's the, there, there seems to be this assumption that somehow we've finally done it. We've decoupled, you know, your valuation from the ability to actually produce anything. We're all old enough to have, to have lived through this a couple of times already, where we've seen this come crashing down quite hard. And I, I, it's a funny one that when you see companies that do that, everybody gets really excited around the novel thing. And like I said, I'm always terrible for it. But the reality is, is that I think the really strong ones that come through focus on building the end end brand. You know, I mean, I think Lululemon did that, right? I mean, they're ops, very quiet, but I mean, they have a very solid supply chain and the way that they've set up the way that they've continued, you know, despite their consistent growth, it just matches as they come through sort of, it's almost in lockstep. So if I can elevate this conversation to a more, to a higher intellectual plane, and I'm going to tap into like the full Canadian background that we all have here with them. I work for Canadian firm, all of these things. I think this can best be situated. Like that's a perfect, everything you said makes a world of sense and it can probably be best exemplified through the philosopher known as Justin Bieber. So here you have a child actor that is massively successful, that is propelled onto a way too large of a stage, doesn't build his supply chain. We watch the problems in between and then ultimately gets back to where he should be. So I think like we can use that philosopher as the symbol of sometimes companies that are young that have the best rocket fuel behind their star. Growing up, learning that stage normally happens as a slow process. You learn your mistakes in the dark without everyone realizing you have order delays, and then you don't do it again. You build that infrastructure. You learn what you don't know. The danger is when all of a sudden everyone's watching you grow up. That's when child actors and child stars become a little bit, right, a little bit um, of, of a tabloid story. And what you hope is you hope that enough people then help them get back and kind of reach their full potential, which again, our, our friend clearly has done. So I think it's just this interesting dynamic there where companies really are no different. And sometimes they become too famous too quickly. I mean, from here on out, I fully expect to see a trademark application or service mark application for the Bieber development curve. You know, you'll be using that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on many, many conversations, and this is the first time that probably an analogy you or a metaphor, I guess, unless in this case, we came using Justin Bieber. So Gary, no longer do we say we're from Canada, okay? Because that obviously backfires quite quite badly. In our <laughs> Canadian, Canadian, well, listen, I think Justin Bieber comparison is a pretty big elevation. So uh, it's one way or another. <laughs> it's intellectual <laughs> too. I, I, so I love how you frame that. Carl, give me your taste in music and I'll pivot to another another singer. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep that for another uh, another show. <laughs> So to te tease this out of, uh, of this conversation, I, I think we've concluded those brands with really strong stories um, that don't need the need for adjacency, particularly, they probably will perform very well as uh, D to Cs. For those ones which haven't developed their operational capabilities, the wholesale model actually may provide a, a great channel to market. But for those ones who are, I would to say, persuaded by the arguments that you know, I can get all this customer insight, I can do all the normal stuff that you know is in the textbook. If they they may have a very strong story, they may have invested in all that marketing team and skills in that area and even leadership. But if they haven't developed their operational excellence, their supply chain, they're likely to at least have lower than uh, expected outcomes, if not run into some problems along the way, in which case uh, the wholesale model might be something they regret coming out from. Would that be a broad summary of what we said? Maybe a little too broad because I would still be careful because I think what, you, what you're insinuating by, by saying these, this either or proposition is if you don't have a truly differentiated brand and you're, you, you, don't, you don't need these agencies, you can just rely on that distribution to make up for your shortcomings, which it won't. So yes, you can still work with that distribution and you need it to support your success, but you got to make sure that it's differentiating you in, in some shape or manner, I think. 
I mean, there are there are there are some 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 exceptions to that, but I I would just wouldn't want people to think, well, it's okay. I, my brand, my product, or my story isn't that good, but my distribution is going to make up for that. And that that is pretty much what the department store demise is about in a lot of ways. Is it was around well, the brands and the products aren't so you know they're they're pretty much the same. But I have I have good real estate and and nice lighting in in decent buildings. That's that's not going to do it anymore. So that distribution has to go one step further but it'll still probably have a department store sort of concept to it the, the neighborhood goods and all these stuff they're trying to reinvent the, pretty much the same thing but i still would just be careful and, and we got to be careful about just over generalizing all of this and it's really comes down to so many different variables to feed the algorithm that you don't want to necessarily just make it a sort of a binary choice I mean, that's got to be it right like that last point like the, the two of you have just synthesized the conversation with a ton of nuance and Jeff brought up the perfect, started our conversation with the perfect metaphor, like forests and trees. Like, don't listen to someone tell you how to run your business. Think about it. Embrace all these pieces. It became a four-letter word. Omni, right? It became a four-letter word because Omni Channel started just meaning econ. And so just, it's every, you got you to figure out where you fit. And in a world where the consumer can be everywhere, you need to figure out where you fit into that ecosystem. And saying without, before you even know one of those channels and one of those approaches is inherently bad, well, that's quantifiably false. But it's also very dangerous to how you think about building a business. That's it, right? It's it's not looking for some sort of silver bullet. And I think you know, just to jump on the the, the nuance train here is I, I think that's the whole thing, right? I mean, DTC I think is hugely powerful. Where it's oftentimes fall, fallen down a bit is that it, it it tends to have a lot of money chasing the new thing that comes in. So build the brand, get it, push it out. You can take the category. And to my mind, it reminds me a lot of sort of um, category killers of the late night, you know, the nineties, right? When we had the big boxes show up when when sort of Best Buy came to town and was going to wipe out your local electronics goods store. And that was that. And you just had to learn to live with their circuit city if we're reaching really back in the archives. But, you know, the idea that you were going to have these things that were going to fundamentally change things. And what you get, I think, is this natural sort of novelty bump. You know, people come along to it. and I think that's great. But then ultimately, you have to create some sort of experience inside and you have to have some fundamental supply issue that sits behind it. And you have to have a differentiated proposition that enables you to stabilize that. And it has to evolve as your, as your customer and your adjacent category start to move around you as well. You know, I think one of the big things that's really killed DTC in my experience, particularly if you look at sort of emergent consumer products that have come out of this, is, is sort of the dirty emergent consumer products that have come out of this, is, is sort of the dirty words around reverse logistics, right? So I think where we've seen an awful lot of value get destroyed in these companies is they are very, very good at getting stuff from a warehouse out to wherever you happen to be, are very, very good at packaging it nicely, doing whatever it needs to be done, shows up, collecting your data and doing something with it. But lo and behold, if it comes back, you know, this is a great thing to worry about. The wholesalers used to take care of before, right? And that was a great thing. They, they managed out. They would find the secondary channels to put the product in if you weren't going to take it back. It was became somebody else's problem. And now what they have is this enormous sink in the P&L where they have to figure out what they're going to do with these things if they come back. If they even come back, it's probably a black hole when these things leave the warehouse and what happens. And so I think, you know, it does it does come down to this, this whole, you actually have to build a business. There is no sort of one-off intervention you can do that's going to solve the issue from start to finish. There you have it, Gary. The beebs and forests <laughs> all our countries. Nice. You didn't know what you were in for when you brought me in. <laughs> it's been a really interesting conversation. Hopefully everybody's taken, I, I've taken loads away from this and certainly when I'm uh, reviewing this and, and, and anything now, but I, I'm going to learn even more that I, I missed the first time. I, I'd like to thank you all for this debate and I think the audience for listening in. My inner Chris Walton thanks you as well. <laughs> <laughs>